Good evening, good afternoon, no matter where in the world you are, welcome to another edition of the Highbury Squad. It is our lockdown series, episode 16, and this uh, woman that we're about to have on the show and chat with is one of my all-time broadcasting heroes. Uh, Not only is she an, an epic human being, but she has honed her craft uh, to the point where um, she really has become the face of the Premier League in the United States. She's beloved by every single sector of fans across this great country and also obviously still has a tremendous amount of support and respect in the UK too. I'm missing my podcast brother, Super Kevin Campbell, tonight and my podcast sister, but I am so happy to be joined by the legend that is Rebecca Lowe. Welcome to the show, Bex. <laughs> Oh my God! You, you, I'm, I'm just so you know, I'm sitting here all bright red. So far after that introduction, I'm, I'm blushing. Thank you so much. That is so lovely. You're sweetest. Thank well, you. Well, it's the truth. So you and I started talking football on World Football Daily about I don't know ten years ago, oh. and you were doing stuff in the UK for ESPN. You were doing sideline reporting. I believe you were there when someone perfectly hit Martin Keown on the head. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> with the, with the football and to see your journey and how far you've come um here in the US as well is amazing Rebecca. There's uh you know we're so proud of you flying the flag for us for our league and just the great work that you're doing with NBC. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so. It, it's um it's certainly not how I thought my life would go. I don't. I think one of the things I'm learning. I, I just turned 40 last month or a few weeks ago. So, and I'm certainly sort of in that reflective mode still. And I, I think one of the things I've learned more than anything is, goodness, when I speak to teenagers and, and kids at college, and I mentor quite a few young ladies who want to get into broadcasting. The one thing I say to them is, I know you've got your eyes set on this or this or this particular role, but let me tell you, I wanted to be an actress from the age of five to the age of 22. And there was nothing else anywhere near my mind. I mean, my mum used to say to me, why don't you have a backup? No, I'm going to be an actress. My dad used to say to me, why don't you go, you know, read English or read, read history at university? Don't read drama. You're never going to get a job. And, and I said, no, I'm going to be an actress. And, you know, it's amazing how 15 years, 17 years of a dream with nothing else coming anywhere near it, can be can go up and smoke almost overnight and you go in a completely different direction and I tell you so right now I I know I'm in the right place and it's so funny how you have a plan in your mind we all do especially in your late teens early 20s we have our plan this is where I'm going to go but just just if you can keep keep everything as wide open as possible your eyes wide open your ears wide open and be open generally because my goodness if I had turned down some of the opportunities I was offered, I would never be where I am today. And where I am today is absolutely, I think, where I should be. So, Rebecca Lowe, are you saying that Emma Thompson stole your acting career? <laughs> <laughs> so, I tell you, I thought I was going to be the one. I thought I was going to be the best. You know what I wanted to be? I had a friend of mine, and together we wanted to be like French and Saunders, who for oh many of your gosh. audience will know them. So yeah, we were, we were... We were, her name was Lucy Lott, and we were going to be the Lott and Lowe show. And that was what we were going to do. That was our big plan. Unfortunately, I ruined that by winning this BBC competition and getting my career. And probably Lucy was left behind and never, you know, she, she did something else with her life. And who, who knows? Maybe we could have made it. Maybe not. But I don't know if that lifestyle of being an actress and turning up at auditions and being rejected, I'm just not sure I could have taken it, so, to be honest. <laughs> well, thankfully for us, you 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 didn't um, become an Academy Award winning actress, but you certainly <laughs> have become um, an Emmy Award winning uh, television presenter, that's for sure. So here's how we're going to roll. Oh. So there's a, a little bit of a lot going on. Uh, I want to talk to you about a whole bunch of things that pertain to how the Premier League has evolved uh, this year. But there's a few people that have sent me um, some messages. And uh, uh, Super Kevin Campbell, who, as you know, is on the show. He can't be with me today, but he. I'm going to start off with Super Kev. Why wouldn't you, right? I mean, put the best up front and uh, and get off uh, on the right foot. So here we go. Here's one for you from Super Kev. Okay. Hi, Sophie. I've got a message and a question for Rebecca. Rebecca, hi. I hope you've worked very well. And it's great to see you doing so good out in the States. And you are the face of Premier League football. Fantastic to see. My question for you is two-pronged. Which team do you support? And two, what was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome getting to where you got to? 
because everybody's journey is different. That's what I want to ask. Thank you. Super Kevin Campbell. He's so epic. Um, and, uh, yeah, what, what's your response wow. to super? I, I know who you support. Well, A lot of people do well, yeah. and don't because you, I, I know you have to be impartial too. So I'll just, I'll just yeah. hand it over to you. Well, okay. Well, first of all, thank you to Kevin. I mean, <laughs> Kevin's like an absolute legend. It's just very, still very <laughs> bizarre to me that even Kevin Campbell would even care and want to ask me a question. I mean, I, honestly, the guy is like, he's Kevin Campbell. So <laughs> that's like surreal enough to me as it is. So I'm a Palace fan. So as you know, yeah. um, many people know this. The, the problem in America is that you're not supposed to have a, have a, well, you're not supposed to be out with who you support. And I didn't realize that. So when I got the job with NBC, because in the UK, you look at any, whether it's Gary Lineker supporting Leicester City or Adrian Child supporting West Brom um, or Jake Humphrey supporting Norwich City, everyone knows who everyone supports in, in the TV world. So to me, I, I think years ago on a show, I said that I was a Palace fan and everyone knew that and that was kind of out in the public knowledge. When I joined NBC, I remember them saying to me, oh no, we don't do that. <laughs> but, oh no, you're not really, you're not really supposed to, everyone's not really supposed to know. I'm like, well, that's going to be an issue because the internet knows. And once the internet knows, the world knows. So um, I, I do try my hardest. But the great thing is that, you know, Palace aren't great, really. So that means that it's not like I'm kind of, we're doing Palace games all the time and they're winning every week and I'm having to talk amazing about Palace because, you know, we just lost to Newcastle and um, Burnley. Wow. So, you know, it's not it's not like I'm having to kind of um, revere my own team every week, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, I, I get accused every single day of being fans of virtually every other club or haters of virtually every other club in the Premier League, which is hilarious, um, but also part of the job. Um, so that's my answer. Huge Palace fan since the age of nine. Um, and once you find the team, you don't, you don't move. Um, and the other answer to the other question about the biggest hurdle, Kevin, um, the biggest hurdle was myself, actually. Um, and that, wow. I mean, that was obviously there were other hurdles with people telling me I wasn't good enough. But really the biggest hurdle was my own, my own ability to believe, it sounds a bit odd, but my own ability to really believe in, in my own belief in myself. So I had this belief in myself and I, I sort of knew that I could do it and I was fairly certain, like 99% certain I could do, say for example, the job I'm doing now, I'm, I was fairly certain of it, but I just, I would have a, I had that kind of imposter syndrome. I'd have that, Really though, I mean, maybe really this is not for you, and 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 that would last for years, Sophie. And it got to a point um, when the big, it got to a point in the UK when the Premier League sideline job for ESPN was so difficult. Um, there was such, I found it, I found the job itself really hard, hardest job I've ever done. Um, the managers just don't want to talk to you. I mean, you saw what happened with Jurgen Klopp and Des Kelly the other day. Yeah. I had many a time where the managers had tried to intimidate me, um, find out what I was going to ask them, told, told me that if they, I asked a certain question, they'd leave the interview. I mean, it was really hard. Um, and also being, and that was 2009 to 2013. And I know that wasn't yet 10 years, well, it was about 10 years ago. It was still a different, it was a different world then, walking around stadiums, with the with the wolf whistles and the chanting and the shouting and it was it was a lot so it got to a stage where even though I had this inner belief that I could do it I didn't know if I really wanted to do it anymore mm. um, and so I had to kind of really look at myself and be brave and decide that it wasn't for me but the funny thing was when I had made that decision the phone rang. I mean, quite literally, so within a couple of weeks of me saying to my husband and my dad, I'm done. I had an especially bad experience at Goodison Park between Everton and Tottenham. And the interview situation was awful. And it was so horrible. And I got home and I said, you know, I've done four years. And I said, I'm never going to get to the top. Ray Stubbs was the number one ESPN. He's a great friend of mine. Mm. and But he's Ray Stubbs. You know, he's a very famous, very established, very experienced. I, I was never going to get above Ray. And on all the other sporting channels, I, there was just no space for any more women and I just thought you know I think maybe I've run my course maybe I never was any good and then when the phone rang and NBC called it was then the hurdle of oh hang on a second actually hang on someone wants to give me a someone's actually wanting to give me the role that I do think I can do okay now I've got to convince myself that I can do it's it's been a, it's been a really sort of wow. flip flop of emotions should we say over those over that the course of my career um, to get to where I am. So lots and lots and lots of hurdles, but probably the biggest is just your own self-confidence, really. 
Yeah. And I think that comes from us being or feeling like we've been told we're misplaced as women talking about football. And the fact that oh. you kind of overcame that and in turn became a trailblazer. I don't, I think you know deep down how many young women you inspire in this country that we live in right now, but also, you know, back home. And there's other great women like Jackie Oatley. I'm a huge fan of Jackie's and Kay Murray yeah. and Alison Bender, who's a yeah. really good friend of the show. And I know you know all of those women yeah. really well. And, you know, there's there's a lot more women who have risen in the game and have, have a voice. And none of that would happen without kind of that bravery that you took and said, you know what, I can do this. And, you know, even for someone like me, I'm, you know, you adapt and you want to talk about football. Okay, I'll cover MLS. I'll do I'll do whatever it takes. I'll go to an LA Galaxy 2 yeah. game or wh whatever it is just to be able to talk about the beautiful game. So the fact that yeah. you were able, able to overcome those hurdles and now are a trailblazer and a role model for all of these other younger women who – can come out and new technology, um, Rebecca, helps the younger audience, doesn't it? You've got YouTube now, you've got all these different platforms. When we were starting out, you really had to be reliant on the networks, the producers, the kind of click of what happened in football and how they made football yeah. Um, yeah. broadcasting back in the day. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think on, on two points on that, so uh, one is, I, I don't know, I mean, it's so lovely to you just call it bravery and, and I suppose it has been at times but I also think that if, if from the age of nine you're told that you're misplaced talking about football you're looked at weird you're spoken about like a bit of a unique kind of because I mean I just loved it growing up went to football every other week at Selhurst Park and none of obviously all my other friends were going down Oxford Street shopping mm -hmm. and I because it was something I loved to do and I wasn't really a sheep I was a bit of a kind of I would just do what I wanted to do I, I wasn't really a follower which was a good thing I, I never really knew any difference. So when I went into my career and I continued to be asked by people, do you really like football? Like, do you actually like it? And I thought, well, obviously I like it. I mean, why would I do it if I didn't like it? Um, but in, it, 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 it's one of those things, I just sucked it, you just suck it up. I think if that's all you've ever known to be treated that way, it's hard to overcome something when you don't even know if there is another way to be treated. And right. only really with the other women in my industry all coming through and starting to, you've got the Me Too movement, you've got all the kind of the power to the woman really in the last five years that we've seen around the world. That's really collectively helped me because that's really made me, I'm moving to a state as well where, where things are a bit different um, mm -hmm. with, in terms of women in sport. But I just, I think it's, it, it's really only taken a collective effort rather than I don't feel like I've done a lot. I just feel like I've kind of existed in this, in this bubble of discrimination, which I've always existed in. And I didn't really do a huge amount except just carry on. And I think that's, that's sort of, whether that's brave or not, I suppose I know, I don't even know if it felt brave. I think I just felt like, well, I don't really know any difference. So you've always called me names. You've always thought I'm a bit weird. I don't really see any different now. I'll just keep going. So, that's on that side of things. And then on the, on the, on the inspirational side of things, you know, I'm really lucky to engage with a lot of fans on, on Instagram. And, you know, I'm not really, I don't like social media on the whole, but I am now on Instagram at last. And it, and the lovely thing is getting to talk to the fans. Now, I, I, I sometimes I can't keep up with all the messages and I feel that kind of stresses me out in itself. So to be honest, but the one, the messages that really, really get to me are the messages from the parents of young girls all the young girls mm. themselves, they're the ones that, that, that shout out a mile to me because to have, the, to have the platform or the ability to influence a young girl sitting at home in, a, in the United States watching who says to their dad, this is what I want to do and Rebecca can do it so I can do it, is, is so humbling. I mean, I actually always got tears in my eyes talking about it because I, ne that's not, I, I never thought that would ever happen. I mean, it's just amazing that there are girls out there who reach out to me and their parents who say, please keep doing what you're doing because I've got two girls and they both now feel like they have a place in this game and I in think, this world and in this amazing. sport. That's amazing. It's really amazing. Yeah. And to be honest with you, seeing you um, be the face of the Premier League here, seeing Kay Abdo be the face and the presenter of the Champions League, seeing Kay Murray now yeah. being the presenter of Bundesliga, I mean, you know, keep keep flying the flag and keep doing what you're doing because you give us all hope that there is, 
you know, a brighter tomorrow about where we're going and what we're doing as women talking about football. And you talk about inspiring. So here's another message for you from a familiar name that you, uh, I think, I think you'll recognize this. Here we go. Hi, Rebecca. It's Amelia Lopez. Um, Thank you so much for Sophie for organizing this. And of course, as always, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, Obviously, I got to see a video of you saying super nice things to me, which I will forever be grateful for. Um, But thank you so much for everything you do, for covering soccer the way you do, for giving us so much uh, important insight um, that I don't think we could get um, anyway else um, that's specifically to you and for everybody here in the U.S. So thank you so much, and I wish you a happy holidays with you and your family. I love Amelia. We, we we hang out um, when the days were better at the LA Galaxy and stuff. And I know that you're a, a fan of hers, and and you guys connect on Instagram. But it's it's about yeah. it's about folks like Amelia. It is it is so. And I I can't even remember now how I stumbled across Amelia. I I feel, I somehow found her blog. I think she wrote an article. And I was so taken by her talent and her insight and her ethic. And I kind of thought, oh, and I kind of, I often, I'm very much into who's written the articles. Like whenever we get sent our, we get sent clips every day, sort of 30 pages of clips from the UK, from our research group. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, for me, is information. I want information. But I also want people's viewpoints. And it's always straight away is who's written the article, the most important thing. And if it's somebody I've not heard of, then I tend to look them up. And I've not heard of Amelia. And I looked it up. I think she was talking about girls I think she was talking about females in sport mm-hmm. and um I just sort of followed her and saw her story and kind of obviously not through Instagram you can see somebody's personal life a lot of the time and I know she's got two young boys who are just gorgeous and and I just find her I just find her like 10 times like more inspirational than I'll ever be I mean the what, what the way she lives her life the way that she is the way that she's like absolutely you know, working so hard, the the mm-hmm. example she's setting those boys. Honestly, it really makes me emotional because, I, you know, I I, I find it as a working mum very very difficult, so like very very hard, yeah. um, to to make that balance. Um, and I have you know a lot of a huge amount of support from my husband, who's second to none, and my company and and all sorts. And I just think Amelia is like, she's just amazing. So that's that's a lovely message, and awesome. I I. I People like her allow other women, they really do, allow other women a network. And a network of women is, and the sisterhood is, is so crucial. It's not always been there. It's not always been there. It wasn't no. there really when I started. So and, and I feel I, like it's there more now. And I thought you'd enjoy these messages because sometimes, you know, you do so much for so many and you make people feel good. Um, Jessica and I always oh. talk about her moment <laughs> and being sent to London. And I'm sure buried under here I have a message from Jess somewhere. But we did this U.S. show the other night and I, I told you like everybody just adores you you know and sometimes you need you need to hear that and so I have uh, another one here and oh god hey, it's Danny from New Orleans I just wanted to take a minute to say hi good morning and I'm thrilled that you're spending time with Sophie today and I'm sure that she will think of all of the questions that I would love to ask you, so I'm not going to go too far down that road, but on behalf of all the Gooner gals, I wanted to say that we adore you, and from yesterday, I just wanted to thank you for bringing up the topic of head injuries and whether or not those protocols need to be reviewed, because we were very much on the same page. Thanks so much, and have a great show. Bye. So I don't know if you know too, but Tiffany, who started the Guna Girls, who I know that you had yeah. on as a Zoom, a Zoom group and stuff, she's also done this thing called Guna Gras, um, which takes on a whole other meaning of Mardi Gras, and all Gunas from around the universe go to Nola and wow. hang out and drink copious amounts of alcohol and have good times, of course. But just another group that just wanted to say hi and and tell you, you know, Aww. what an inspiration you are. Oh, so I was so low and a little bit overwhelmed. That's so lovely of Tiffany and um thank you so so much to her. I just this country amazes me, you know. I mean the pockets and they're not even pockets actually, the the vast areas, the vast sways in this country of football fans, of Premier League fans that have been there forever and, and really only in the last seven years I would say have been able to kind of find their voice even more through mm. NBC's coverage and the kind of social media side of things that connect everybody. I mean it's really it's really taken on fandom so far in this country and, and to have a, a you know the Guna girls I mean that's just that's just magic to me that really is that is huge and I love 
I love them. So you, I'm you would love the dialogue in that them. Facebook group too, um, Rebecca. <laughs> they, it gets very salty and very, very interesting. Right, here's a question from Amanda, yeah. my um, podcast sister and, uh, and co-host. Okay. Um, uh, so here's one from her. Here we go. Hi, Rebecca. It's Amanda here. So sorry I can't be on the show with you today. I was planning to, but unfortunately it's a work thing at the moment. <laughs> but anyway, a couple of questions for you. Um, how did you get the job in the States? And what made you want to go over there to promote Premier League football? And also, who is the best, most interesting footballer you've ever interviewed? And who is the worst? Okay, enjoy the show. <laughs> Bye all. <laughs> First of all, I just love hearing, I love hearing Amanda's accent. It just makes me feel so homesick. Isn't I it love great? it. Um, <laughs> it's so great. Don't work. Oh, I love it. Um, okay, first question was, how did I get my job in the States? Um, I think a lot of me getting my job in, at, at NBC was down to taking the job with ESPN USA. So when I was with ESPN UK, I was the primary sideline reporter, FA Cup presenter, women's football, etc., and the London 21s. And then ESPN USA said to ESPN UK, can she come and do, we need a presenter with Bob Lee. Um, to do the Women's Love World ball. Cup because they, I tell you why, do you remember, um, oh my gosh, something's going up my head. The presenter from Good Morning America who went to NBC Sports, he started at ESPN, I'm looking at him in my, in my brain, and like, um, um Josh, 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 um, uh, you know who I mean. Yeah, I know who you mean. <laughs> Uh, to Josh, whatever his last name is, I've forgotten, um, was at ESPN and then got this big, big move to Good Morning America or whatever. And they suddenly had an empty space and they were like, oh, Josh who are we going to get? Josh so Elliot. they looked. Josh Elliott. Josh Elliott. That's yeah. right. So it's going to be Josh Elliott and Bob Lee at the Women's World Cup 2011. Josh went and got Good Morning America, massive, massive job. They were like, oh, what do we do? They went to ESPN UK and said, can Rebecca do it? And to be honest, I, I, I was like, oh, cause <laughs> it's a crazy thing to say, but I, I really valued my summers off, okay, so, because the work around the, around the clock football season, when you get to the summer, so, you know, if you do the World Cup or the Euros or the Women's World Cup, it's, it's all the prep, right? It's a month of prep, then it's a month or six weeks at the tournament, you come back, you straight back into Premier League season, and I, I needed rest, and I was a bit like in two minds, and I was thinking, I'm not sure, I kind of, like, I, I think maybe I just need a break, and my husband was like, what are you talking about? I was like, oh, yeah, what am I talking about? I'm mad. Of course I'm coming. So I went to Germany, Bob Lee, Brandy Chastain, Julie Foudy, Mia Hamm, um, Brianna Scari. I mean, the, the list goes on, Tony DiCicco. I mean, just wonderful, wonderful people and had the most fabulous time as the second presenter behind Bob Lee. Never thought anything of it, went back to work, had a, had a really good year at work in terms of a couple of things happened to me, which going back to self-confidence, really helped me. It's kind of, it sounds terrible, but it was at the expense of Fabrice Mwamba. You'll remember Fabrice Mwamba oh, yeah. collapsing at the FA Cup quarterfinal. Well, I was presenting that show, pitch side, with John Barnes and Kevin Keegan, and it was the hardest thing I'd done in my career, without a doubt. Keeping that show on the air, not knowing if he was alive, knowing his family were watching, talking to Kevin, who was in tears, John Barnes. Um, that was a big moment in 2012. Then Ray Stubbs had to go into hospital, and have a heart operation so what uh, there's a man called Andrew Hornet who now works for Amazon Prime who or Amazon uh, TV who was the head of ESPN UK and he said to me um Ray can't do the FA Cup final and you're going to do it and I remember thinking there isn't a million there isn't there isn't many there aren't many people who would have done that because mm -hmm. there were other men around and it was 2012 we weren't 2020 yet and he said you're the job I'll never forget it and I said, wow, uh, wow, uh, sorry, the FA Cup final, Chelsea Liverpool, um, pitch side, eight hour broadcast, no prompter, nothing. Uh, Kevin Keegan, um, who else do we have? Craig Burley, um, Gus Poyet, and John Barnes, they were the four, uh, pitch side with me. And I did that in 2012. And that was huge. And off the back of that, um, again, and ESPN USA had me back, um, to do the Euros. This was out of Bristol, Connecticut. And this was number two to Bob Lee. Max Bretos was also on the team. What a great guy he is. Oh, yeah. And we all had a great time. Taylor Twelman, Michael Balak, brilliant summer. Alexi Lala did that. While I was doing the Euro 2012 in Bristol, Connecticut, we were in a meeting and Amy Rosenfeld, who runs the football department there, who's a superb friend of mine, lovely woman, walked in and said, wow, we've just lost the rights to the Premier League. NBC have just won the rights. 
and she was talking to the ESPN guys. I mean, I didn't didn't bother me. I, I was going back to England. I was like, oh gosh, interesting. Okay, because ESPN and Fox had shared it. Mm-hmm. I didn't think anything of NBC. I didn't know a lot about them other than they were massive and they had the Olympics. So I went back to England, started my final year with ESPN UK, and had got to the point where, like I said, I was gonna. I think I was done. I just was fed up with everything, um, and I didn't really see a future in America, even though. I had a great time on these American shows. I didn't really think there was a future. Um, and I think that Pierre Moussa, who runs the Premier League on NBC, had seen me on air um, during, during, the Euro, during the Euros in summer 2012 once they'd won the rights. And from what he tells me, he made some phone calls uh, kind of to get references and decided I was the one, which is a little bit life-changing. And... I got a phone call out of the blue from my agent in the October, I think it was, of 2012, to say, are you sitting down? And I said, yes. And bearing in mind, this is somebody who had basically decided in six months' time, I w- I'd, I'd met with BT Sport. I decided I didn't want to go to BT Sport. Um, and I decided I was going to like own a coffee shop or something. So fly- <laughs> I was just done. And he said to me, <laughs> he it. said to me, um, NBC, I know, he said, NBC are flying me to New York to discuss you hosting the Premier League on NBC. And I went, no, no, you mean being a like a sideline reporter? And he's like, no, I mean moving to America and being the presenter. Amazing. And I, I, I remember where I was. I almost fell off my chair. It was one of those, like, your whole life, you know, just turns upside down. So he did that, and, you know, the rest is they history. flew over here. We had meetings. And the, re- the rest is history. So that's, that's how I got the job. Um, what was the question after that? It's so is so is so brilliant. Well, uh, she asked you about your best and worst player interviews. <laughs> um, <laughs> She's cheeky like that. I love it. <laughs> yeah, um, there are so many best. I mean, there really, really are. I'm very lucky to have interviewed so many. Uh, you know, Ian Wright it will always for me oh, go down as as somewhere near the top. Not obviously, he's a Palace hero to me. I know he's obviously a. Arsenal hero to all of you. Um, we you're welcome. Him. We, we time share him, Bex. We time well, share him. you know, we we made him. We made him. You finished him. Um, <laughs> but no, he's a he's absolutely, you know, the most interesting human being. And I think if if I haven't interviewed him enough, but when I've interviewed him and I did some corporate stuff with him, uh, I, I, it helps that I absolutely adore the ground he walks on. I think he's a national treasure, and he should be, you know, held up. Um, Ian Wright for me is 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 very much up there. Um, I always remember interviewing um, players at the African Nations Cup who, I remember interviewing Lamana Lualua, who, you remember him who played for Newcastle, uh-huh. yeah. and he was playing for the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they were in the middle of a war, and I did a one-hour interview with Lamana Lualua mm. about that and his life and where he'd come from and what it was like and what his family were doing, and, and you know, stuff I... I'm a girl from Ealing in London. I don't, I don't know anything about the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this man was, it was just another example to me of all of, they are very much two dimensional to so many people. Um, and you just scratch underneath the surface and you find out just so many depths and so many of these players. Um, and he was another one, but there were a lot in terms of the worst, um, <laughs> yeah, make it a Spurs player so, uh, just I, for us make it a Spurs player <laughs> <laughs> you know what no I've never I, I, in all the years that I've interviewed players whether it be sit down longer interviews at training grounds or post-match interviews at grounds and I've interviewed hundreds of them I've never come across a rude one mm. um, I've never come across a difficult one I've come across shy very shy and difficult to interview and, and kind of abrupt um, that, that, I've come across that quite a lot um, and I found that difficult but I really haven't got a bad word to say about any of the players. Some of the managers, but not not the players. The players have always, were always, I think it's a generational thing. I was very much the same age as them. And so having a female talk to them was a little bit less of a problem than maybe some of the older managers I found down the years. Um, but talking to any any player with, with who gives a one-word answer all the time is, is very, very difficult. And yeah. that happened a lot um, down the years. So, you know, but the players were great. So they really were. Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, you know, from my PR entertainment days, I find I find the talent easier to deal with than the reps, like the PR people or the agents. The talent, yeah. once you get the talent on yeah. the ground, they really are mostly super engaging and, and they get into it. Okay, I'm going to get you out. I know it's your day off, so I, um, I'm going to get okay? you out on some quick fire stuff because uh, people really want to hear your opinion. And a lot of the times when you're the moderator and the host, 
you you navigate yeah. the conversation so you're really getting the best out of the players and and that's kind of you know having Kevin on our show as well you know getting his insight taking us into the Arsenal dressing room right now I sent you a text message two weeks ago said if we lose today the sky will fall and then we lost and we lost yesterday too I know I I know it's just so brutal it's so painful and you know this is our life this is part of you know a lot of people think we're just shadows but really this is a a part of our storytelling (laughs) and our memories and our life and so when you're in that hot seat and you've got these VAR decisions and you see David Luiz you know carry on playing and then he drove himself home after yesterday too and yes yeah yeah he drove himself home oh my god and that was something you were kind of vocal about yesterday too and i know sometimes it's not easy because you have to navigate that dialogue so talk us through firstly what you saw yesterday with the david louise and the head clash because even arsenal fans couldn't defend our coaching staff putting him back on and leaving him on in the game Yeah. Well, I, the first thing first of is I defer always to the chaps in the studio. Mm-hmm. And so my, I take my lead from them and I watch them and I observe them very closely. I try not to lead them. Um, I will nudge them, but I try not to lead them. I, I'm talking about off camera while we're watching the game. So yesterday while we were watching that game, obviously five minutes on the clock, it happened early doors. Um, I just, I observe their reactions. Tim is a very, a very emotional watcher of football matches. He jumps up, he runs about, he's That's very so vocal, cool. um, and uh, Musty and Earl the same. And so I get a lot of what they think just from the way their initial reactions are. And they both were like, first of all, obviously, the, the noise, the noise that happened when the two players con- mm-hmm. collided. I think I said, please look away, close your ears if you do this, because the noise was dreadful. And, and, and one thing that I've learned over the years is that footballers and fans see things very, very differently. And it's, it, it's not to discredit people like myself and fans and broadcasters and, and, and regular fans. It's really that footballers are very, very much on another level. Whether you've played conference level, MLS level, Premier League or World Cup, they have an ability to see things that we just can't see because we have never been in that position. So I can watch a game, whether it's with my husband, who had a 20-year career as a, as a footballer, or with Tim Howard or Robbie Earle, and I will say something, and they'll say, absolutely not, look. And I'll say, no, no, I'm right. And they're like, look. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, how did you see that first time? They're incredible. They have an amazing ability to sense something and see something. Um, so, first of all, when the incident, once Jimenez had gone off, we knew Jimenez was, get, was obviously going off the pitch. Mm-hmm. We were watching Louise, and we were thinking that the blood thing, is kind of, for me, is irrelevant. Whether he's bleeding or not is irrelevant. And, and P, I have seen people say... I have had people say to me, actually, last night on Instagram, well, it was a blood wound. It wasn't a concussion. Well, <laughs> if you heard the noise, it, this, this has nothing to do with a blood wound. And that disturbing. noise, I mean... It was his, disturbing. Yeah, Jimenez, absolutely. Jimenez's head didn't make that noise against nothing. So it made that noise against Louise's head. Now, the, the concussion situation in this country is so much better than it is in the UK. And both Tim and Robbie were very, very animated that, that Louise was carrying on. They could not believe it. And as the first half was going along, we were going through in our minds Ryan Mason, that it happened two years ago, who had to retire, the old Tottenham player, through concussion when he played for Hull. And other players, Taylor Twelman, of course, is the famous one in the U.S., other players, of con- you know, concussion. And, and I asked questions. So I asked Tim questions. I asked Robbie questions. And, and Tim talked about how you get very aggressive when you've been knocked out and you come round. You get very aggressive because you are just totally disorientated and you often, a sign of a player that has gone out and been knocked out is that when he, when he stands up, he starts pushing the physios away and says, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. That is a clear sign that you've been knocked out. Now, Louise didn't lose consciousness, but, but the boys knew from the noise that there was a major problem. There's no way in the world he should have been carried on. So what I do is I speak to research. I get the full wording of the protocol from the Premier League, which was, it's up to the doctor. And we are just staggered that it's up to the doctor. So we're having this whole conversation, me, Robbie, the research guy, Joe, and Tim. And I'm thinking, if we're having this conversation, so then everyone at home on their sofa is having this conversation. We need to have this conversation at half time. So I think my role is find out what the boys think, find out what the rule is, and then find out what should happen and talk about what should be happening. But it's difficult, you know, because... Doctors, you know, you don't want to discredit doctors that you've never met. That's not what I'm in the business for. I'm not, I'm not in there to, to, to criticize medical people who know a lot more about it than I do. But, but if, if two football 
Thomas, who's played the game at the highest level, are telling me that that is wrong and that he should not be on the pitch. We have to talk about it and we have to bring it some awareness to it. Um, and they're both very strong. I mean, Tim was like, Tim was incredulous. And then at the break, of course, we said, we hope he comes off. And I said, well, yes, we hope he comes off. But if he comes off, it's almost worse because you're saying yep. he was concussed. There was a problem. So we left him on for, we played with his brain for 40 minutes. Yeah. And then after that, we thought, you know, actually, let's give them the rest of the game off. So things like that, I, my role is to listen and observe from the players, people who know it 300 times more than I'll ever know it, and the, most people on the sofa because we've never been in those situations, um, and then try and put across their points of view and not my point of view. But I also, of course, I have a point of view, and it happens to be the same as Robbie and Tim's, which which helps. But it, sometimes... I, you know, I think differently, and so I offer a different question too. But in a situation like that, it, it's very, very difficult to think that that was right yeah. yesterday. And so, and, as a journalist, you're impartial, but it's, it's at some point it crosses the line, and and for everybody, that really crossed the line yesterday. There's no point in me saying, well, maybe actually he didn't hit his head. You know, there's no point in that. No. So that's kind of the process of how it works. And, and I think um, listeners and viewers are so much smarter now too, and they understand that you guys are cross-checking all of your info with, as you said, yeah. Premier League experts and, and people on the ground. So when you're reporting and you're saying things, you're you're getting real-time information and stuff and the way you guys see the game too you've got all of the different tactical cameras in your studio so you see the game a little bit differently to um to the viewer and i think most and, and also so don't yeah. forget both players had, had seen that again we didn't yeah. show it to the audience many times exactly. but they've seen the replays they and they they know what they're looking at they really i mean they, the guys will tell me an injury mm -hmm. before we, it, it, the guys even left the field of the player. They know what these players, they know what injuries look like. They've done it for 25 years. So yeah. Robbie Earl will say to me, oh, he's done his ankle there before we've even got the physio telling us he's done his ankle. So the guys look at the replays. They they know, they know knew that that was a problem. Yeah. yeah, and that's the great part about following and watching the game and listening to these guys is they lived it and breathed it. And that's what Kevin was saying to me yesterday yeah. about how you know, because I, I feel like Arteta may have lost the dressing room a little bit. And he's like, well, have you ever been in a dressing room? And I, I love those kind of juxtaposition um, conversations because, no, I haven't. But I'm coming at it from a fan point of view, too, which I think makes it all so, so interesting. OK, I'm going to get you out on these couple ones. Um, VAR. So there's been a lot of stuff going on, <laughs> polls. Uh, Jurgen Klopp lost his mind the other day, which we haven't really seen Jurgen do. I mean, the pressure's getting to him, of course. He's defending the Premier League. He's got a ton of injuries. The, can, the, the fixture list in 2020 has been crazy, but we've all had to adapt in so many different ways across all walks of life. And interviewing people... I always, I kind of say it to Rebecca because we did our post game show right after the Wolves game yesterday. Not always a good idea <laughs> to do a post game show after a defeat like that. But, you know, he's going to come off hot. He's complaining a little bit. But VAR, I mean, it's been the whole point of having the technology was to get decisions right. And we still are debating. What's the scoop? Yeah. Well,. VAR, so okay. So I saw the I saw this poll on the Athletic about people saying if you could get rid of VAR, would you get rid of it? And eighty five percent people said yes. Well, that's ridiculous because ten years ago, if you'd said to people if you could put VAR in today, would you put it in? Eighty five percent of people said yes. So so you know we can't all throw our toys out the pram when we have answered the prayers of generations of footballers, generations of fans and referees who've called for technology forever. Now we've got it. It's not perfect. Absolutely not. The, the offside is the problem. I mean, I don't see. Yes, there's gonna, there's going to be other. Like, I don't think it was a penalty with Danny Welbeck um, and the um, Andy Robertson. I don't think that was a penalty. The referee went to have a look at it. He did. That's human error, or that's human subjective opinion, which I'm fine with because it's a game run by humans. Now, did it waste a bit of time him running over and having a look, and he was told to, and all that. But at least he's refereeing the game. At least it's his choice. And that's no different. Chris Kavanagh, I think it was, who decided that that was a penalty for Brighton um, when most people didn't think it was. That's no different to 20 years ago when the referee decided a penalty and no one else thinks it was. You can't fix human beings. 
We are not robots. So I'm okay with stuff like that. What I'm not okay with is the offsizing because it was not brought in to be offsized by a toe. Now, have you seen what the Aerodivisi are doing with the, they're widening the, the lines the line, on yeah. the graphic. So, mm -hmm. yeah, which is really interesting. So the two lines are like going to be, I don't know what the numbers are, but like an, a, an inch wider. And basically the upshot of this is, the benefit of the doubt will go to the attacker. So there's going to be a margin for error. And the margin for error will mean play on, will mean goal, will mean yes, that's fine. Even though the toe's offside, the toe will fall within that margin, the armpit will fall, the hip, whatever it is, it's going to be goal, which will, which which is really what offside was always supposed to be, which was give the benefit of the doubt to the attacker. But if they're crazy offside, then that's completely, that's a huge disadvantage and you should, you know, that's not allowed. So it's really going back to basics for me. You can't now scrap it. You have to tweak it and you have to improve it. Um, and, and these things take time. And we all want immediacy and we can't have immediacy when you're talking about computers and humans mixing together. Um, that's not always a brilliant combination. Usually separate, they're a bit better. But together it's going to take some time. They're not perfect. These referees are not. But my God, thank God we've got referees though. I mean, all, we, we spend our yeah. lives criticizing these men, who, by the way, I haven't heard a, a word out of any referee about the amount of workload they now have. There are hardly any new referees. They are now doing a game on a Saturday and a VAR on a Sunday. These, these guys are really putting a service in to the Premier League. Um, and yes, they're not perfect, but neither is, neither is Nicola Pepe for the headbutt. You know, we're none of us are perfect. And VAR is not perfect. It needs tweaking. The, the offside rule needs serious, serious looking at. But as of now, it's not really doing anything wrong because for what it's been told to do, Mo Salah's offside. And, and would you hate that, which I do, I hate it. But it's not wrong. It's kind of right. But it's, it's a stupid rule. They should change the, you know, they should tweak it. So I think we've got a long way to go. We have to try and be patient. It is the same for everybody. You're going to get up, you're going to get down. You know, I'm Palace fans. I've often thought VAR's against them, but so is, so is every team. And it, it's the same with every referee. VAR is just another referee. So it's not perfect, though, but we can't go backwards now. We've no. got it. The genie's at the bottom, but we've just got to tweak it, and we've got to allow it to, to, to get to where it's going to get to, and it will get better. Um, yeah. But we've got to stop this ridiculous. The other thing that we've got to stop, you know, is when Palace get um, a goal and, and it's a crazy VAR decision, we're all happy, even though it's a crazy VAR decision, we're all quiet about VAR when it goes our way, and when it doesn't go our way, we, <laughs> yeah, massive, massive hypocrites, though, and that's got to stop, or at least that's got to be talked about, because that's a big problem, because that's holding up, it, that, that, that's making it black or white, that's making it, do you want to drop it today, or do you want to keep it today, well, it's a ridiculous poll, because everyone who's had VAR go against them at the weekend is going to say drop it, and everyone who's had it go forward is going to say keep it, I just... We can't drop it. We can't drop it. No. We've just got to make it better. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you, you know, look, the NFL still has issues and they've been doing it for years and years. You've got um, leagues in Europe, but also I, what I like what MLS do, uh, Rebecca, is, you know, you're hearing the um, the officials talking through the decision, yeah. which, yeah. you know, could be something that the Premier League introduce uh, for certain stuff. Agree. But, I think the yeah. thing we'll all agree on is you're guaranteed to get a Man United penalty in a game at any any point. <laughs> <laughs> Cheeky, I know. All right, so let me get you out on these uh, quick fire bits here. I want you to, um, you're the voice of reason and your voice is very soothing. So I want to hear you say yeah. that Tottenham will not win the Premier League. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, the only, the only reason I'm saying this is because on the lowdown week one, I was told I had to make a prediction and I went with Chelsea. Pretty so good. Tottenham will not win the Premier League. <laughs> I'm going with Chelsea based on my original prediction. However, what I would say, and I'm really sorry, guys, but I do love seeing Tottenham up there just as much as I would oh. seeing if Arsenal were up there, only because I am the, I'm a born underdog and Tottenham are not an underdog in anything except for the title race. And over the years, they've not won it, as we, as I'm sure you've spoken about a million mm -hmm. times since 1961. So they, in that way, they're a Premier League title underdog. I love that. I love it being more than one race, one horse in the race. Um, and so I don't think they're going to win it. 
but I'm kind of only saying that because I have to go with Chelsea because that's who I said at the beginning. <laughs> I, I think I, I like that. I like your angle there. Very well done. Uh, the Arsenal fans will appreciate that very much. I, I think we're so pissed off in so many ways because we know this is that kind of year where Leicester won, where anyone can win it. You know, Liverpool yep. have so many injuries. Yep. City are kind of, you know, evolving. Manchester yep. United still trying to find their feet. Chelsea, can you trust yep. the, the young team and, and Lampard to take it all the way? And so to see us regressing the way we have, in a nutshell, what are your thoughts on Arteta's Arsenal? I, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, my, my, the big flashing red light is Aubameyang. I mean, the guy yesterday looked like he'd forgotten how to play. Oh, no. he, he took the ball at one point, round, uh, I think Patricio had come out and he miles out, and he was scrabbling to get back in his goal. And the old Aubameyang would have, quick as you like, turned and shot. This Aubameyang sort of like meandered on a very slow 360 degree turn, looked ahead, and then just like limply shot it at the first defender. Yeah, he could have taken it down the wing with his left foot cut. He could have done a million things that the older Bamiyan just a few weeks ago would have done. Um, the body language isn't great from him. I don't know if he's lost confidence or something's happened. It's very, his efforts on goal yesterday and his movement was very weird and very un pierre emerick so I'm concerned about that. Arteta... You know what? I just don't understand it, really. Because one week, you go to Old Trafford, you beat them, and everyone's talking about the process and how we're all in this project, and we're all along with Arteta, and we believe in him. And then it wasn't that long ago, four or five months ago, that PR coming out of the club was that Arteta's now the manager of the club, and he's he's now the head coach of the club. I forget which one he changed to. And he's now in charge of it because now we trust him even more because he's shown us how great he is. He's won the FA Cup, and he's, he's kind of, he's got a handle on everything. But we forget that he's so young in management. Mm-hmm. And so he's going to make big mistakes like Lampard did at times and still does. So I'm a bit confused as to what Mikel Arteta is right now. Some weeks I think he's got him and he's got it. Yeah. And other, and I think that his perception of the way he handles himself on the weeks where you win, you buy into him loads because he's this kind of very calm, suave, smooth exterior. And then on the weeks you lose, I look at him and, I, and I'm like... I'm just not, not, I'm not yeah. sure about you. Like you're getting I'm a just, corporate just sure. response. You go from this innovative young manager who has a lot of bravery and is saying things that sound really smart, but then kind of when we lose and we lose more, he sounds like he's given the corporate line response. Yeah. It's really weird. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think it is weird. the cup, the cup, um, you know, Bex, you, we've talked a lot about 2015. Wenger probably should have left after that FA Cup win. Uh, it masked a lot yeah. of pain, as great as it is to win the FA Cup. He won the FA Cup. The difference between him, him and Unai right now is the fact that, you know, Arteta won his cup final. Unai didn't. Unai's record in the Premier League is superior to Arteta's now. In Correct. fact, we've regressed under Correct. Arteta. Look at us. We're in the bottom half Correct. of the of the table now so it's okay to start asking questions but obviously as you can imagine in the Arsenal universe that's divided people once again it's not I'm not saying Arteta out but it's okay to us start asking questions and I think it happened when he shipped off Guendouzi to Germany he ostracized um, Ozil uh, Sogradis which is more understandable and you know, has given preferential t- treatment, it seems like, to Willian, even though he swans off to Dubai, he comes back, he gets right back into the team. I think Aubameyang loved playing up front with Pepe and Lacazette. Something's not quite... Are you, that I don't know what the boys in the studio have been saying, but something is not quite right there now. Something's happened. No, you're actually right. And actually, Robbie Earl said yesterday he thinks something's happened. He thinks mm-hmm. something's happened with Aubameyang and maybe with Arteta, I don't know. Because Aubameyang was very happy after the Old Trafford game. After yep. he scored that penalty, his post-match interviews were like super smiley, super humble with Arteta. Something since that game has happened. But you're right. The discipline issues are a problem. So you've got William doing what he did and going straight back in the first team. But you've got Gwendouzi being a bit of a muppet against Brighton and yeah. disappearing off the face of the earth. Well, I'm not quite sure who's worse there. At least what Gwendouzi did was that he's a wally, but he did it on the pitch while he was doing his job. Right. William did something. And by the way, William's over 10 years older than Gwendouzi. So I'm not sure how that works. And and the as a few, there was a few other disciplinary issues. Obviously, you had the Sabayos Louise situation. Sabayos seems to be a touch of a troublemaker. Um, but he's in the starting lineup every week. Um, at the moment, I, it just seems a bit all over the place. He doesn't seem to have a handle on anything. Um, and with and with the captain, by the way, I, I I might be wrong, but it didn't sound to me. I couldn't find an Abamian post match interview yesterday anywhere. No. He's the captain of the club, yeah, Joe hiding. Willock. 
Yeah, was, I know. I mean, Joe Willett came out. No, I'm no. sorry, that's not good enough. You just signed a, a, a new three-year contract on God knows how much a week, and you can't, you can't get anywhere near the goal right now. Turn up, show up, apologize, explain what's happening. Don't send Joe Willock out. I know. Well, listen, you guys are going to have a very interesting North London Derby Day this weekend because Ooh. if Ooh, if that way. result goes against us in a horrible way, uh, the, the, the toxicity of the Arsenal fandom yeah. will rise again. There's no doubt about it. It has already a little bit. Okay, so you have been epic and I have eaten up an hour oh. of your free time <laughs> on a Monday where you should be no up problem. resting and walking. I'm going to leave you on this one because uh, my Tony is a huge fan of the Dan Patrick show and as you know, I often appear on there with <laughs> They give me 30 good soccer seconds, Rebecca. I've been trying to get it up to a minute. And maybe you can help me with a campaign here to get it to a minute. But we've got yeah. to know, um, we love Dan and those guys are, are, are epic. And I, I talk with Seaton and go back and, uh, and forth with him on football and Twitter and stuff. Who's your favorite Danette? We've got to know this one before you go. Oh, my God. It's like, is that like asking which one of my children do I love the most? That's tough, isn't no, it? No, that's like asking which Robbie do you prefer. That's <laughs> oh, like, that's you can't pick. You know what I mean? I can't, I just can't, oh my God. I mean, I've, I've kind of hammered all of them over the years. Like I've been kind of cheeky. I mean, when I used to go into the, <laughs> when I used to go into the, <laughs> I used to put aftershave on. Because, Tony's like, look at them honestly, putting aftershave on because Rebecca's coming. Honestly, Paul, I know. <laughs> Paulie with his aftershave. I, mean, I think I've just got to go Paulie. I mean, he's just always been like a, such a sweetheart. So, I mean, Fritz, he's hilarious. I think it was, I think it was McLovin that had this pair of white of shorts on his big old white legs. <laughs> and I absolutely hammered him. I was. I said to Dan Patrick, he must remember to get some milk on the way home. And like poor Robert yes. Glover was like, oh, that's a bit unfair. I'm going to go report. I love them all. They're all great. And Dan, Dan is, I mean, what a ledge he is. He's I mean, I, I couldn't love him more. So, yeah, yeah I'll go with Paulie. That's love. That's cool. And you, sir, and Mike Tarico is another legend too. And, uh, and absolutely. you yourself, you yourself. Uh, Bex becoming a legend Aww. of the game here and thank you for all <laughs> that you, you do thanks for flying the flag for us Brits but also now you know um, your son was born here in the United States my nephew was born here in in Colorado too and there's a huge part of me that's been living here and um, for so many years with my partner and my 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 dogs my kids and it's a it's a great country because the people make it a great country and, and you're flying the flag for both now and it's amazing and we appreciate everything that you do. Thanks, so You know, I, I, I love England. I'll always love England but this country, is it's true, you know, it might have had a bad press over the past few years but um it's great. It really is great and it's it's welcomed me, my family with open arms and we'll, we'll forever be grateful. Amazing. Rebecca Lowe, host and face of the... Premier League here on NBC. Thank you so much for joining the Highbury squad. Thank you so. Love to everybody. Take care.